very important, I think, that when we're all here gathering to understand what it is to actually and how we can raise our level of consciousness. Because it is the very thing I believe can change the world for the better. That is something that we have as humans. And we have a beautiful brain. And this brain can be honed and basically nurtured and valued to be able to make the right decisions and not be reactive and have us be in control of our own thoughts and our own actions. Because what changes the world, for better or worse, is our mind. And then from our mind and our thoughts, we create action. And action sometimes creates our reality. So it can work for us in a good way, and we can work on the opposite way in terms of anger, resentment, frustration, depression, all of these things that can also happen to us. So I'd like to start today, or uh, tonight, with um, a beginning, you know, because why me, right? I came out, and everybody doesn't know me that well, but I came out, I was a dancer, and I suddenly became uh, uh, an actress, you know, not that I hadn't tried it before. But it changed my life quite a bit. And as a child, I, and why I'm talking about myself as a child, because we all have a child in us, and that child in us sometimes is repressed, and sometimes is quite alive. But I think it's important to go back for us to look at us as a child, and what it is we experienced that actually took us to where we are today, right? Again, for better or worse. But I look back at my childhood, and I remember my childhood as being very happy. I had two very loving parents. They were very strong. They were very supportive. Um, I was a dancer. I knew what I wanted to do. And my nature was quite light, quite happy. I liked playing by myself. I really was uh, that kind of kid. And then it came to pass that things changed. And things changed for me in a moment's time. And that is when I was in sixth grade and we were going down to see a movie. And it was so exciting because I didn't have to do math and I didn't have to do whatever. And I was so excited because we were going to watch a movie probably on agriculture. <laughs> but what I saw and the lights went out is a big screen that had nine, eight, seven, six, five, four, three, two, one, pew, and a blast and a screaming and crying, and, a, and, and, and the whole camera is panning across screaming moms and bloody people and children looking for their moms and dads and annihilation. And it said, this is what will happen if there's an enemy attack. I started to shake. I was 11, going on 12. My brain wasn't finished by any means. And I had seen something I never thought I would see in my life. And it changed my body, my mind, my heart, my nervous system. I couldn't move except shake. I knew that I was going to die. I knew that I didn't have much time. And I knew I would never kiss a boy. And I knew that I would never get married and have children of my own. Because the bomb was going to kill me and Russia was going to bomb us. And I told the teacher, I need to go home. I, I'm going to lunch. And I said, oh, Goldie, you never go to lunch for home. I said, don't. I said, I know, but uh, my mom prepared a lunch for me, and I need to go home. And I, I ran home, because I walked to school every day. And I called my mom, and I said, Mommy, we're all going to die. Now, she came back and, of course, did what my mother would do, which is, kind of, what the hell are they teaching our kids? <laughs> How are they going to be able to handle all of this? So, of course, she calls the Department of Education. Everybody in her pointy shoes and her straight skirt and her purse was still in her hand because she came back from the, from the shop that we had. And, and she explained to me why Russia would never do this. So I had a moment of cognitive awareness. But that stayed with me for a very, very long time. To where that even we'd have air raid sirens going on, I didn't want to go to school. Oh, I pretended my leg hurt. Or I thought maybe I, uh, I wasn't feeling well. Because just hearing that sound changed my whole being. Even then, I used to call the, the fire department. And I'd say, is this an attack? Is this an enemy attack? Now, I'm sharing this story 
because it was the beginning of an understanding of what a child can be susceptible to and how vulnerable our children's minds are and how important and potent they are and all of the potential that our children have we need to become aware of. So as I went back and did my whole thing and suddenly I'm on laughing and everything's great, but you know, everybody either loved you or hated you. You were someone that everybody had an opinion about. And I started thinking about that and I thought, you know, I'm gonna figure this out because I have to figure out how to get through life in a way where those opinions don't matter. Where I'm able to look and say, oh, well, that's very nice, thank you very much. Walk away, don't have it sit on my ego, not have it matter one way or the other, but be able to just live my life as me, the definition of me. Who am I and what do I want and what am I going to give back? And these, this was my mantra. But then came a time when it became stressful and I started to look into psychology. And I started to go to the, you, what I consider the university of me or the university of any of you. Who am I? What do I do? Why do I behave that way? How do I handle this? And that was many, many years of looking into the psychology, not only of me, but also of the world around us. I then became interested in neurobiology. Believe it or not, while I was flubbing my lines, I was trying to understand how the brain works. That was a long time ago. Because there's something about human beings that are so powerful, I wondered if we ever used our whole potential to be kind, to be unflappable, to be loving. The Art of Loving was one of the most important books I'd ever read while I was going through that period of uncertainty. So at that point, I started to meditate. Once again, it was the 70s, and that was sort of the thing to do. But I was curious, again, about the mind. What does it do to the mind? How does it create or shift or change your mind? I went in there, and I got a particular kind of meditation. It was transcendental meditation, which at that time was very big. And I was, you know, taken in. They got a mantra. I got a thing. They put me into a room. But the incense, there was a beautiful flower on the altar, there was the window coming, the wind was coming through the window, and the, the for curtains were doing this. I mean, everything was perfect. And I sat there, and I did, repeated this mantra. And I tell you, I cannot explain, because like His Holiness the Dalai Lama says, you have to taste the tangerine. You can't really explain how it tastes. You have to taste it yourself. Well, I, I liken that to my first experience of meditation because I revisited a part of myself that I didn't recognize, that I lost. A piece of myself where I could feel my own heart beat. I could hear my own heart beat. I was able to breathe and feel calm and I felt like giggling. And I did. I had this sort of internal giggle, which I kind of wondered where that tickle comes from, that little tickle that sometimes lies dormant in your heart or your chest or this beautiful place right here. But it came up. And I tell you, I was rediscovering that little girl, that little piece of potential that loved life that never locked her door, that, cut, that took rocks and cut them open to see them sparkle, to be able to jump in leaves and smell them when they were just dry or looking for acorns and making, making necklaces about them. These are things that I remembered, the feeling I had. So meditation became a very important part of my life. I meditate every day and it has changed me, but what I didn't know and I started to learn just recently when all the research has come out, is that meditation changes your brain. That our brains and what we know now and the plasticity of our brain is really the most important aspect of understanding who we are and what we can become. And meditation quiets down the various aspects of the brain. 
that allow us to just be. Be in this moment. To hold this moment as pure perfection with nothing ahead of it and nothing behind it. It's being in this moment right now. And it's very hard because the world that we live in today, we're not jumping so much in dried leaves anymore. We're not unlocking our door and trusting our neighbors anymore. We don't know who to trust. We live in very uncertain times. So my career went on, and heaven knows which this isn't about that. But as life goes on and I became a certain age, I looked at that and thought, well, this is good. What a great career. I think it's time for me to do something else. Why? Because my philosophy is that we just should never stop growing, never stop asking questions, and at the same time be brave enough to step out and do something that you think could maybe be impossible, but something you believe in. And that, to me, was to bring some of these principles to children. That I would be able to take all that I learned over this time period and be able to apply it and give it to children. I wanted every child in the world, and I would sit in my meditation room in Vancouver, Canada, and I sat there, and my meditation came, and I said, okay, I knew I had to do this. There was no question. That, that this second, third, whatever act of my life is, is going to be about this. So I left everything I was doing. I moved into the world of neuroscience, moved into the world of psychologists, moved into the world of children, of teachers, of education, of meditation <coughs> experts, of mindfulness, His holiness, um, Satchitananda. I looked at all religions. I went to the Sufis. I studied all religion, not just one. Because there's a spiritual peace in every religion. So religiosity of in itself wasn't what I was looking for. But what is the kernel that asks the big question of who we are and how we're going to actually bring the light that we've been given out into the world? So I put together, now I got busy, I started producing. <laughs> And I produced a script. And I had a script written. I hired the writers. And one was a neuroscientist. And one was a mindfulness practitioner. And one was a teacher, a beloved teacher. And another one was a positive psychologist. Because my philosophy was this. First of all, to just get a child to meditate is not easy. So we didn't take it into what we'd call mindfulness meditation for six-year-olds. What I did was, is I decided that we have to teach our children how their brains work. We ask them to use their brain. Think. Quiet down. Go sit over there. They have no idea how to move their brain because they don't know how it works. So I thought, OK, that's number one. Give our children context of their amazing, fantastic, incredible brain. So we did a very simple brain lesson. They learned about the amygdala. They learned about the prefrontal cortex. And they learned about the, the hippocampus, which is where we remember. In doing so, we then have three times a day a brain break. Because children know, and as we all do, that every brain needs a break. And that, of in itself, the brain is already becoming used to having a quiet time three times a day. I asked the children, do you know what mindful means? No. I would go to schools. No. Do you know what mindless means? Yes. I thought, well, we're going to change that around. <laughs> we're going to know what mindless means, but we're really going to learn what it means to be mindful. So we have mindful of our senses. We also have positive psychology, which is acts of kindness and perspective taking. Why? Because, and gratitude journals, because we want our children to be empathetic. We're losing empathy. Our children are becoming depressed. They're on psychotropic drugs. 
They can't think the way they would normally think or create the way they normally create because they become a troubled child. Because they might stare out the window and dream. Or they might be disruptive, just like Albert Einstein. So we're deadening our children's minds oftentimes by not giving them the correct prescriptive for what is going on. 9-11 happened. That's when I knew the world had changed forever. And when that happened, I had a visceral experience because I knew I was going to die. These children did not know whether this was happening once or over and over again because of the many times lack of consciousness of our own media. Our children watch television. They watch a lot of television. They watch too much television. And now what happens is, is they don't, can't decipher. How is their little brain that's not done till they're 24 years old ever going to be able to understand what's going on? So we're dealing with fear. We're dealing with uncertainty. We're dealing with a downturn of economics. We're dealing with children who actually are broken homes. Their dad left. They cry. We have children who are foster children. We have children who are sick. We have mothers and fathers who are fighting all the time. And we have, even today on our news, we have people who are in high places saying terrible things to each other. We want bullying out of our schools. We want children to understand the value of each other. This is a high philosophy, guys. I get it. But on the other side, nothing was going to stop me from doing this. And people said, you'll never do this, Goldie. You'll never make this happen. And I said, watch me. Because I am watching these children change in front of my eyes. Vancouver, we did a big research at University of Vancouver. And what was changed in these children was they made themselves happier. They said that it reduced their stress, that they were able to sleep at night. They talked about how they took it home to their arguing parents and said, just take a breath. Just take a break. Don't yell at each other. Think. This is what we hear. I said I'm taking it on the road. So at this point in time, MindOp is serving approximately, as we can calculate, close to 3 million children. And this is now a 13-year dedication to what I believe is, could be the beginning of changing the way the world works. Raising consciousness, becoming more able to look at a problem from 30,000 feet up instead of from their muddled little minds that have never been resolved and know how to quiet down their mind. So we'll talk about a little bit this later, but I'd like for you to be able to see our video. Might give it a little bit more understanding. In the UK here, we've got about 20,000 children right here in the UK, right in London, really, have been doing Mind Up now for several years, and we're adding more as these years go on, which is exciting. So I'm here, obviously, for UK, Mind Up UK. But we are also in China. We are all, we're in Hong Kong. We're also in uh, Australia. We're in South America. We're in uh, Canada, U.S., um, Serbia. So, and we're just going into Jordan. And hopefully we're going to be getting into Dubai. And we're moving in through the world. And this was my dream. And even though I knew it was a big one, I think it's happening. So I'm very excited to share this with you. And it's just a little film, but let's take a look at it. The reason why um, we needed Mind Up was because we wanted to make sure that we had happy individuals. The school had been put in to notice to improve. Academic achievement was relatively low. Anger, anger is a, is a big thing for these children. We're pretty used to the idea that doing well in exams will help us to flourish later in life. But leading psychologists actually think that the biggest single determinant on life outcome is our ability to sort of self-regulate. I did a bit of research and I knew a few schools that were using Mind Up. I went onto their websites, had a look at those and I thought, this could be it. I think we're all facing different kinds of stress. That's why I wanted to create a program that brought tools for these children to help them recognize their stress, reduce their stress, so they don't carry this. MindUp has four pillars. The first pillar is learning about your brain. 
when the teachers understand how the brain works as well, you know, the knowledge and understanding about the neuroplasticity of the brain and how we can change habits. The fact that we in the programme provide the teachers and the children with the tools to be able to take control of that is the most empowering aspect of the programme. The second pillar is a brain break. Every child, every brain needs a break. When I do brain break, it calms my amygdala down. Our brain breaks are what helps our children focus. When we begin to quiet the mind, it strengthens the mind. A brain break is uh, when the teacher reads out a couple of steps and everyone closes their eyes and when, when we hear the chime, we're supposed to open our eyes and look to the front of the room and smile. We give them mindfulness practices which are wrapped around their curriculum to create more focused attention. If we are to teach children effectively, we need to have their attention. No matter how good any child is at maths or English, if they don't have the tools necessary to lead a happy life, then they're going to be in trouble. Our fourth pillar is our place in the world. We can empower them and even if they don't have the best role model, they have that knowledge and then we can start making a change, not just within our school, but hopefully the community. When I'm older, I think it will help me because if I'm an adult and I'm getting really stressed, um, I'll know that um, I need to be calm, learn how to have self-control and be calm within myself so then I don't make as much mistakes as I would have made. And I think I'll do it for the rest of my life. It really unites them as a class and as people and as children. You actually see the children using the strategies they've learnt in Mind Up within their daily lessons and it just helps them to stay in control of their learning. Instead of us adults talking to, talking to other schools about, about how it works, I'd really like to, for our kids to go and talk to them. I'm grateful for help with friends. The way they can talk about it. I'm grateful for being me and having an amazing education. Is for the age group is quite frankly fantastic. So I'd just, I'd put our kids up. Every child needs a chance to thrive, to feel that they have a special gift. And if we don't give them that respect, we're not doing our job in educating the leaders of tomorrow. Just listen to our children. If you want to know how it works, there's, there's your proof. Julia, you stand up. This is our Director of Education, Julia Organ, right here. And Laurie, would you stand up? This is our CEO, Global CEO, right here. Laurie Coote. Emma, would you stand up? We can't live without Emma here at our organization. Take, she just takes us and does everything for us. You're an amazing. Thank you, sweetie. Well, I, um, should we do a brain break? Want to try it? And then afterwards, we'll ask some questions. Anybody that has a question, even about the brain break, right, and about the meditation or whatever. It won't be long because, you know, we've got, we all have dinner, don't we? <laughs> but it, it'll give you an idea. At what age do you start the children? Ah, uh, kindergarten. Actually, we do have some in preschool, but we do different kinds of things with them uh, in terms of getting them to focus and calm down and so forth, like putting teddy bears and having them lie down and watch their breath uh, actually move the teddy bear. Uh, we're all in high school right now, so we've moved from, we started actually kindergarten and to eighth grade, and then now we've moved into modular aspects of mind up, a little bit more advanced, of course, uh, in high school <clears throat> and upper school, up until 12th grade before college. So three, four, three, four-year-olds? Yes, we have four-year-olds, five-year-olds, and uh, it's pretty amazing how they respond 
you know, and ways of actually learning to say good morning even and how they look in someone's eyes to say good morning around a circle. So, you know, there are many things that you can show a, a young child how to do. And there are things at home that we can do with our children. One of the things is, is that we don't ne necessarily punish our children. What we want them to do is think. So we create a lovely little place for them that is quite beautiful. And they make it as beautiful as they can. And they bring little stones that they love and they put pictures that they love and maybe a truck that they, whatever it is. And it sits in their little corner and it, it's very beautiful. And when they're not behaving well, they get to sit there. They get to sit there and they get to look and get calm and we teach them to breathe. I mean, I, I don't have a picture or anything to show you, but just so you know, I have a three-year-old granddaughter, and she's quite amazing, and her brothers are six and nine. And just perchance, my daughter-in-law found them all meditating in my bathroom. <laughs> and she took a picture. So she was breathing the best she could. And she looked over at her brother, but she stood there. And one, one of them was totally deep in meditation, Bodhi, interesting name for him. And that was my other grandson. So the answer is yes. You can start training them very young, and they really love it. That's the other thing. Kids take to it like a duck to water. I mean, they ask the teacher, Miss Perry, did you forget our brain break today? I mean, really reminding them, could we make it a little longer this time, you know? Of course, I could figure out why. <laughs> but <laughs> you can't fool me. It's only three minutes. Um, but anyway, so, so I'm going to hit the bell. And what we do with the kids is that we, we say, OK, I want you to listen to this bell as long as you can. Now, that's because I'm explaining it because there's a why for everything. There's an, a why and then there's an answer. The sound of the bell, first of all, is a sound and a vibration that actually has direct effect on the mind and the body in connection. It's an energetic vibration. So you, these are important. When church bells ring, it feels beautiful. These kind of things aren't new. But it's important to share with a child because it quiets them immediately. On top of it, it gives them the ability to listen for as long as they possibly can until they can't hear the bell anymore. What that does is it begins to develop the brain to be able to focus for longer periods of time. And what we've discovered is that the child who just starts stops hearing it really early. But then as time goes on, he's listening more and more and more, and suddenly his hands don't turn over for a much longer time. So it's building brain strength, brain fitness, as well as calming the mind and the body. So after that, we say to them, and I say to you, the mind is a busy thing. The mind thinks all the time. It never not thinks. It doesn't stop thinking ever, not even when you're sleeping. It's working things out. It's sifting things out when you sleep, which is why it's so important to get seven, eight hours of sleep. <coughs> Wake up refreshed. On the other side, it also helps the, the brain to, to, be, to be strong. Okay, So we want to be able to know how and what's going on inside the brain while we are in a, st a state of meditation. So know that those thoughts are going to come. But what they do is just they're like moving clouds. Just moving clouds. Let them go. They'll catch you. They'll hijack you. You'll start thinking about your work. You'll start thinking about that thing you never said. You'll start thinking about, oh, the, the house I'm going to decorate. That's me. And, and, and you look at all that, and, but you don't get attached. It's the attachment that we have to lose, because everything's impermanent anyway. The beautiful thing is that you're free spirit, you're free mind, and you don't get so attached to something that it ruins your day. But let's say it doesn't ruin your meditation. So that thought comes across, and you let it go. That's just a cloud. It's a thought. Come back to your breath. Oh, 
there's another one. Oh, come back to your breath. <coughs> Give it no, 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 no credence. This way you build strength in your brain and ability to focus for longer periods of time. So I'm going to hit this. Everyone close your eyes if you want to. You don't have to if you don't want. You get very comfortable. I take a nice deep breath. <sighs> Just relax everything into your chair. Now I'm going to ring the bell, and now we're going to try to follow the sound as long as we can. And when that sound is over, turn over your hands and start to breathe simply and easily and just watch your breath. It'll get irregular, it's okay. And watch those thoughts and don't get attached. Open your eyes. Now, we do this three times a day with the children, and you don't hear a pin drop. And what you realize is that you do hear noises around the room. You are beginning to, to look at the different kinds of things that you can hear. It changes a lot of things. And our children are so much calmer, so much happier. So this is part of what we do. And I would love to be able to take any questions you have, even about this last experience, to see about it. Any, any questions at all? Yes. Hi. Um, will you be um, carrying on research to see what effect this has on these children into their adult lives? Yeah, I'm sorry, would you just take the microphone a little bit away from your mouth? Um, so the research you're doing with the children now, yeah. will you be carrying it on to see what effect it has into their adult lives? Yes, there's actually right now we're raising money um, with, for Harvard University. They want to do a 20-year longitudinal study, which is for health, mental health, as well as it is for physical health. And they will be researching everyone from teachers to children to parents to communities to nursing. It's a, it's a really big study. And they, they're waiting for us. They don't want to do anyone else. I'm very excited about that. So the answer is yes. We've also done another longitudinal study uh, at University of British Columbia. Uh, and that study was children that had this years ago. And even those who had it, in fifth grade or just once um, said that actually they're still doing it. And uh, a couple of them said they wouldn't have gotten through college if it hadn't been for, for this program. So it's that kind of thing that we're trying to nurture in the, in the children <clears throat> for their future. Yes. Any other questions right here, please? Um, have you done any research into how diet can change the quality of children's mindfulness. Yes. And is that available <clears throat> on your website, or, or how does yes. one find out about that? Well, the, the, I can answer the question because I've looked into it. Diet is what we have under mindful eating. So we have mindful tasting, which is one of our exercises. And inside of that, we have various things that we've given the teachers for applications for that particular exercise. And that is about the good foods to eat, the body, what happens to digestion, as well as how to chew a food, how to taste a food, how to know whether it's bitter or sweet or sour. Oftentimes they can do adjectives around that, sentence structures. But whatever, it really is about becoming more mindful of what you eat and, and so forth. So the answer is we don't go into dietary uh, things, but we're teaching the children what sugar does. Um, where, you know, one of the things that I would like to be able to create, we haven't done it yet, is a, is a video, an uh, animated video. So every time the child eats sugar, you've got certain organs going, no, no, not again, <laughs> not more sugar, <laughs> you know. Um, but this is kind of, you know, isn't it fun? So anyway, that's, that's 
I, it's a, very important, and we know that food is a huge issue with kids. Goldie, Not to I mention have a, my, my potato chips I had last night <laughs> after my <laughs> Goldie, I have a question for you that I think a lot of people, be, we've something we've talked about a lot, which is what happens to a child when they actually learn about their brain? Why is that such a breakthrough? What happens? Well, when they learn about their brain, first of all, they are so proud of themselves that you can't even stand it. I mean, one little kid said, w would you like me to tell you about my brain? And I went, I would, I'd love to. He said, well, you see, you have this amygdala, and the amygdala is there, and you quiet it down and put that dog back in the doghouse, then mm -hmm. it's going to disrupt your thinking. So mm -hmm. you have to get it so your prefrontal cortex, but they call it the PFC, <laughs> works better. So then I can think. And I love also when they take it home and they're working with their parents, you know, to try to get them to become more mindful about certain things. So when the children learn about their brain, they really, really feel that they have a handle on how to help themselves, you know, and not hit their brother. God, how many kids have said, I wanted to hit my brother, he makes me so mad, but I think if I do, then I just better breathe because I'll get in trouble. <laughs> That's what we call critical thinking. Wouldn't it be great if all of our politicians had that? <laughs> that would be awesome. Another question. One in the back. Let's get a microphone to you, sir. Wait, wait, say that again into the microphone, please. How do you stop yourself getting attached to thoughts? Because you made it sound really easy. And I oh, explain how you, how you dismiss. Oh. It's about lack of judgment. Yeah. Oh, right. Well, first of all, you have to know what's going on in your brain. Forget everything else. Forget the person you're mad at, forget the thing that's going on. You really have to know if you're thinking straight. And usually when you're on fire and you're reactive mode and so forth, you're not thinking straight, right? That's why we want someone who's a solid thinker who basically is around us, that we, we can actually learn from. Because it's important to regulate. And what's going on in your brain is that we have a, we call it an amygdala, but there's two of them. And these amygdalas are really, these are very important parts of our brain, which help us save us from lions, tigers, and bears. It's a very primitive part of our brain. It also lights and lights up when we're in love, which is why we make horrible decisions when we think we're in love. <laughs> we get in terrible trouble because it's all lit. And sometimes you think, but God, you're not thinking. No, I'm in love. That's also going on with the amygdala. What is it doing? It's just dimming down your thinking process. And your thinking process and your analytical brain is the biggest part of our brain. I mean, it's the one, the biggest of all the animals in the world. It's amazing that we have it. But the reality here is that if there's too much emotion going on, then all that facility there that helps us analyze and problem solve and make decisions and so on and so forth, actually feel happier too. That of in itself is dimmed. So in an fMRI, if you were to put that head in there and you were to look at the brain on fire, you're going to see that that brain on fire is going woo, 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 and those amygdalas are just lit up in blue or something. And the prefrontal cortex is dim. So my answer to you is this. When you start getting fired up, take some breaths. Don't react, because breathing changes many things and take some really good deep breaths. And then quiet down, because know what's going on in here. This won't let you make the right decision. This will. And I think that's the way you can dissuade and actually neutralize what could be a very damaging and also a negative emotion. So Goldie, when a lot of people first learn how to take a brain break or meditate, you're very good in your instruction. You say, just let the thought, the thoughts will come, the thoughts will keep coming. Your brain's just gonna keep thinking, but just let it go. And that's where some people get tripped up. Can you talk a little more about just noticing? Yeah, noticing is an interesting function and, and intention, right? I mean, everything starts with intention. You want to intend to become 
a meditator, then there are certain things you need to understand about that. Or that we have the intention to be happier, right? Or that we have the intention to have better focused ability. Or that we have the intention to lower our reactive process, right? So there's all kinds of reasons why. But you know, the idea of thinking is a beautiful thing. You don't want to eliminate thinking, so you have to embrace the fact that your brain is going to think. However, what we want to build is objectivity. Objectivity, interestingly enough, is looking at something with no designs, but you become a witness. Witnessing a relationship, witnessing a set of circumstances, witnessing anger of someone else, witnessing behavior of your children, whatever, is the greatest gift you can have. Because then you are a witness to it. You aren't involved to such a way that you are going to be hurt or angered or, or, or do something you wish you hadn't done or said something you wish you hadn't done. Or you'll be able to be helpful. A witnessing something gives you as a person the ability to watch. And we have what we call metacognition. Metacognition is we're the only people at the moment we're beginning to study dolphins that actually can watch themselves. I can see myself sitting here talking to you. I'm watching myself do this. I mean, my brain is telling me to do it, but there's something amazing that I'm actually watching everything right here. You know, my son was a hockey player, and he was a goaltender. And he had to watch the puck. But the question is, how do you keep your eye on the puck and watch the game? And I think that that's an interesting analogy of how we have to be able to see everything but keep our eye on the ball. When you meditate and you allow those thoughts to go, you don't hook onto them, and you come back to your breath gives you this resilience and this understanding of witnessing. Witness your thoughts. Don't attach to them. It's a great exercise to the brain and a wonderful gift for a lifetime. Thank Did that, you. was that clear? So one right over here. Yes. Hi. Can you stand up so we can see you? Sure. Hi. Um, I'm curious about your daily routine that you do. So how long do you meditate every day? Do you do the three brain breaks? I do. I will meditate for 10 minutes in the morning or 20. And I will sit for 10 or 20 minutes. But I also do it throughout the day. Because I believe that it's important to have start your day out the right way. But I also believe that the brain is something that habituates. It likes to habituate to certain patterns. And if you do it three you know, minutes a day, wherever you might be, at your desk or your whatever, or you're sitting in your car, or before you get out, meet the children for the day, sit in that car and just have a three-minute meditation or brain break. The brain literally loves it. And it gets very used to dropping down very quickly into that wonderful spot of the now, the right now. I know that with children I used to have to stop when I go to work. Because when I walk through the door, mommy, mommy, and I it was like my day all over again. I did not want to be there for them in that moment. So I just, I cleaned out, and I was pretending that my day was starting, and I didn't bring any of my work home with me because they were the most important thing. So that's, that's that. We have one over here. Can you stand up? Yes. How do you differentiate uh, uh, mi mindfulness uh, from TM, trans trans Transcendental Meditation? And also, the neuroplasticity you mentioned. What are the impacts of uh, mindfulness on neuro neuroplasticity? Well, neuroplasticity, of course, is the greatest thing that we've discovered about the brain, and we're still discovering things about the brain. But when you affect your brain in a positive way, whether it is you're working for positive psychology, which actually creates more uh, dopamine emission in a way that actually is very good creating a sense of well-being, which is what dopamine does. It's a neurotransmitter. Um, th that is important. So transcendental meditation is a form of meditation. It isn't the only way to meditate. 
And I think that we all have to feel comfortable with the way we do. Some people love to follow their breath. Some people like a sound. Some people like a very long mantra. And some people like to just envision light in their heart. And I do that sometimes. I change my meditations often. Because sometimes I feel I need to bring the light into my heart. And when I do, sometimes I get weepy because it's the most beautiful feeling. So it's just a question of who we are. So I think TM changes the brain, changes the heart, changes your ability to be patient and tolerant. And the same thing goes with other forms of meditation. Did that answer you? OK. And I think we heard from one of our scientists that as little as 15 minutes a week will change your brain, right? Mm -hmm. Yeah, the, it's amazing. So we've got it's one in the back? Incredible. OK, we're going to do this one first. Um, a sort of double-barreled question, really. First of all, do you apply this to the anguished minds of those who are, who are in prison, for instance? Yeah. And, and also, um, can you and do you help uh, people who are suffering from uh, post-trauma yeah. syndromes? Like you probably did in your own way when you were 11, 12, had that experience, because surely people are... Yeah. terrified of being still and confronting their thoughts in the first place. Mm. Well, that, the most beautiful thing about understanding thoughts, you know, Freud was a very amazing doctor. I mean, he was a great psychiatrist and understood the brain. He obviously was early on, you know, but he okay. did something I thought was fascinating. And I tried it, and it was called free association. Does anybody, do anybody have, remember, do anything like that? No? Oh, my God. So anyway, he was a pioneer. Well, I did that. And when you lie down and you free associate, you say whatever comes to mind. It's absolutely frightening. Because you think, what's going to come out of my mind? What's in my mind? What am I thinking? Oh, no, I'm thinking about my car. Oh, well, I, I'm thinking about the stoplight I saw. I'm thinking about, and what happens is that it starts to, to, to take your mind and actually open all these windows. And I had the most extraordinary experiences because it was peeling away an onion of thoughts that seemed that they had no rhyme, no reason, you know, just sort of emptying out the brain. It is scary. It is amazing. It's wonderful. So on top of it being afraid, I think that everyone needs to excavate their own mind. I think it's an interesting journey. Um, just like going down to the pyramids, right? <laughs> it's like, what am I going to find in there? Um, don't be afraid of your own thoughts in your own mind. Um, I forgot the other part of the question because I love that, what you Post said. Post-traumatic stress. I mean, talk yeah, about what you want to do with the military. Yeah, so we're, we are, I have been working with, you know, certain people who are working with the military as well. I've spoken to some brigadier generals about it. Um, <clears throat> we will be working with them. They are being actually worked themselves with mindfulness now with some friends of ours that are research scientists and so forth in mindfulness field, which is wonderful. It's working for them. Does it work for everybody? And I think that's a big question. The answer is no, because some people are so, so deeply disturbed and troubled that they may need medication. If they are on medication, mindfulness is all the more beautiful because then they are able to experience it. We have a lot of mental illness in the world, a lot of mental illness here in the UK we're dealing with with kids, and a lot of mental illness in America. And I think that there are, actually Canada, we're, we're, we, we have a bit of an epidemic going on. And I, I think we shouldn't set a blind eye to that. So, I, you know, again, let's start with our little ones, you know, and let's you know, grow them a little differently and teach them things that will help mitigate some of this, 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 this un uncertainty and fear and all the things that they live with, that they bury, that they don't share with anybody. So it becomes a thing. So the answer is yes and yes. I forgot the question, but I know. <laughs> I, I know. <laughs> we have one, one in the back, and then, I'll, and then I'll get you. Yes, sir. Yeah, um, Goldie, I, I agree with uh, virtually everything you say. Um, I just have one question that you center your uh, philosophy on the brain and, and the mindfulness of the brain. 
but what is the role of the heart and soul and how is that connected? Mm. Isn't that the center of us as mm. human beings, the heart and soul? Mm. That's a beautiful question. There's always been an interesting curiosity about the mind, the heart, and the brain. Because the brain seems so clinical and dry. But the brain is really what we have to work with. And I think that it creates stepping stones. Because what's happened is, is that without even knowing it, without even really teaching how to be nice or how to do this or how to care for someone else, it naturally happens when you put them in an environment that stimulates the heart and the soul. And what we talked about earlier was that what we think and what we feel is often what we create and how we live our lives and our reality. And what I believe that if you do bring these practices into the school when they're little, that they do create a sense of spirit and spirituality. Without trying to create spirituality for children, I think that's not possible because you can't go in there and say, I'm going to create spiritual children. But you can set a beautiful environment and create a world inside of their classroom that is safe, that's loving, and that shows their own potential of being kind and what happens when they give something to someone else and actually having a discussion about it. How did that make you feel when you gave that elderly person that beautiful letter? Oh, it made me feel so good. Good for you because it's important to feel good to give back. That creates spiritual life. That's how I look at it. I could be completely wrong, but I think we're all so connected. The mind, the body, the spirit, everything is connected. We're a beautiful mandala that oftentimes gets clipped in areas that we can fix. And I guess that's the way to look at it. Then. Yeah, I think one of the things, too, Goldie, that you do is um, when you teach the gratitude for the children, talk a little bit about how that opens them up a little bit and how that changes their gratitude brain. Gratitude is something that children often don't feel, and they're not asked to feel gratitude. So when you get in our gratitude circle or you make you know, different little programs, we say, well, what do you feel grateful for today? And, and some of the children have nothing to be grateful for. They don't know. So the answer is fine. You don't know. You'll think of something. Might be that hamburger you ate. Could be that amazing, beautiful, some picture you saw. Maybe it was some funny little thing that you did. You'll remember. Don't worry. No pressure. No wrong answers for gratitude. The next day, these kids will come in oftentimes and go, I know what I'm grateful for. That means they're thinking about it. That means that we planted a seed of what you're grateful for. So what's happened is that now, this is a great story. There was a little boy who was bullied in the classroom. He didn't want to go to school. He did go to school, but he didn't want to, and he didn't sleep much at night. It was pretty bad. And they had a gratitude circle, and there was one little girl that said, and they put little things in the paper, and you opened it up, and it was, I am grateful for Jesse. He's my good friend. And this little Jesse was the one who didn't think anybody liked him. And it changed his whole being. He was so happy and so proud that someone was grateful for him. And I think these kinds of moments are life-changing for children. So gratitude has science around it with our adults has taken depressed people out of bed. So great, gratitude is not a little thing. It's actually quite a big thing. But it's important to do it every day. Because once again, we've got that old brain thing. Um, and that will start, your brain will start shifting. And so instead of getting what I call the Grand Canyon of negative emotions, which goes on with your, the way your neurons fire, neurons that, what is it, fire together, wire together, is that you're able now to be able to supplant some of that with positive thinking and gratitude. Okay, we're gonna take two more, one in the back here and one over here. Hi, 
Um, my name's Sue Black. I run a social enterprise called Tech Mums, which is teaching mums technology skills, mums in disadvantaged areas to improve their employment prospects, help get them back into education. The idea is to really build mum's confidence and their tech skills to, to affect their lives, but also to affect their children's lives through the mums. So I'd really like to know, I'd like to, to include some mindfulness in what we're doing, because we're doing tech and confidence, but mindfulness, I think, would fit really well with that. Yeah. So I'd like to know, is that a possibility? Can we get some kind of short program from you? Uh, but also, have you done anything with parents with the aim of affecting the parents and then subsequently the children too? Yes. We have parent program, and so we also teach our parents. So in the schools, our parents come in. We have a parent program. We have a parent workbook here. Do we have a workbook here for parents? Or a I did bring one tonight. Okay, yes. and so we are working with the adults because oftentimes the adults will say and the parents will say, but wait a minute, our child is getting it, but we need this, right? So clearly we've done that. Um, as far as um, working with them, uh, I think in terms of the adaptability of our program, uh, we definitely, we should talk to some people. Maybe you could give your card and we would be able to because it really is about giving them, first of all, the ability to, to quiet down you know, because they need to understand first. They have to put, as we say, the oxygen mask on them first. Part of the reason why is that no one really did. So I think that when you do self-care, and they know that they're worth that self-care, and they have that, then they're going to be much better parents. So I think there's a way to work with that for sure. Thank you. And Thank over you here, for what last question. Yeah. Hiya. Uh, you've spoken about how you're teaching kids to think after an event so that, so that, that, so that the feelings come after, uh, which helps them be more compassionate towards others. Is that part of your program where you help kids deal with negative or automatic thoughts so that they can feel better about themselves? Yeah, um, I think you're talking about putting your empathy, putting yourself in yeah. someone's shoes. Yeah. We definitely have that. It's one of our lessons. And it's called perspective taking. And so we take literature uh, of their age group. And one of the things is, or newspaper articles, or you know anything that we'd like to talk about, and take a perspective on it. What does it mean? What were they thinking? Why do you think that happened? Um, it's problem solving in an interesting way. And once again, there are no wrong answers. And I think it's important for children to have the experience where their opinion is a, is a worthy one. So they're not afraid to give their opinion. And they actually have a value to themselves because of it. So I think that's what you're asking, is to the ability to problem solve um, and have peaceful resolution. But you can't do it until you're really looking at something in that direction. So perspective taking, I think, is, is really important. Great, well that wraps up our Q&A, so thank you very much. And